So I'm 31 now. My conservative estimate is that I will hit this number at 40 years old. And I think where a lot of guys get into a trap, they come over here and they don't think about the long term. They don't think about when they're not going to be able to work for money, right? They get older, they don't have the health, they may not be as attractive to potential employers that want the latest skill set. And the money equation is really the, one of the most difficult parts about living in Thailand that a lot of people struggle with. What's the story, folks? Pete here from Tires Times. Hope you're doing well out there. We took a break last week, but we're back with a vengeance this week. So today we're going to meet Alex. He's from America. He's currently living in Thailand and he's got a plan and a goal to retire early and make the dream a reality of living in Thailand long term. So he's going to share that story with us today. He's also going to talk about his favorite places to settle down in Thailand. And then he's going to talk about what he calls the expat status game, which is a zero sum game, a competitive zero sum game. And he's going to get into that in this video um, I'll just say this before we start. He's not a financial advisor. I'm certainly not a financial advisor. So take everything that's said with a pinch of salt and make sure to do your own research. Coming up on the channel, I have some big interviews coming up. I've got one really big one. Uh, I'm really excited about it. Uh, it's going to be... Oh, just, I'm excited about it. It's kind of a rare one. Anyway, that'll be coming up in a couple of the next couple of weeks. Anyway, let's get straight into this video. I hope you enjoy it. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the like. Leave me a comment. Cheers. Let's roll it. So Alex... Thanks very much. Appreciate you coming on here. Um, let's start where we always start. Tell, tell me about your background, where you're from, and uh, you know, let's get into your Thailand story. Yeah, so I'm originally from the United States. I grew up in a city called Nashville in the southeastern United States. Um, so kind of part of what's unique about my background is that uh, I lost my mom when I was eight years old. And I lost my father when I was 10 years old. So I was actually raised by my uh, maternal grandmother from Japan. So I think when a lot of people think of America and they don't necessarily always think of a guy that looks like me, uh, but I felt like growing up, I always had one foot in the Western world and I had one foot in the Eastern world because my grandmother was always insisting like, hey, I know this is the American way, but, but like I'm Japanese, so we're doing it the Japanese way. Uh, but it always kind of, I always find, kind of felt a little bit different from my peers in that regard. In that, in the southeast, there's just not as many Asian people. Like, I was probably a young adult before I ever met somebody from Thailand. I felt myself wanting to uh, keep meeting new people and trying to experience new things. And I, uh, to kind of parlay it into to my Thailand story, I ultimately it. So I was 20, I think I was 24 years old. This was in 2016. No, I was 23. I went to, to Burning Man. I'm not sure if you've heard about Burning Man, uh, but it's this really, really big event in the Black Rock Desert in Nevada, uh, northern Nevada. And I think in recent years, it's attracted like 70,000 people. So tons and tons of people go, over there, go there from all over the world. And I met a buddy there. And this really is one of the most pivotal. I met a few friends there, and these were some really pivotal moments in my life. But that first year, I met my friend named Jesse. And Jesse was a world traveler. Uh, and he's from Seattle, Washington, in the northwest of the United States. See, I watched his travels. I looked on Instagram as he'd post pictures from Costa Rica or uh, from New Zealand or all these different places that you hear about or you dream about as a kid growing up, especially uh, in a place like the southern U.S. And you're thinking, like, what is out there? And and part of that, too, that intrigued me was my maternal grandfather, who I was close to before he passed uh, when I was quite young. He had traveled a lot. He grew up in a small town in the western U.S., and he wanted to get out of that small town. So he joined the Army. He served in Korea. He served in Vietnam. And I thought, if this if my grandfather who came from a small town and has these, this guts to like go out and, and put himself out there like that. Um, I should too. And I was talking to my friend, Jesse and uh, Jesse was like, you know, Hey, I'm over here in Thailand. I'm here for a year. He was living in Chiang Mai at the time. And I was like, well, he was like, why don't you come check out Thailand? You checked out Mexico. How about Thailand? I was like, well, yeah, man, but like, I got to get this wisdom tooth out and they're quoting me $2,000. And, you know, do I really have the money to pay two grand for, uh, you know, my wisdom tooth removal and then buy a plane ticket and go over there? And he said, dude, you can get that done for way cheaper here in Thailand. Why don't you just come over here and get it done? And I was like, 
okay, fine. I'll come over there. And so I booked a, a round trip ticket to uh, Bangkok. Actually, I didn't even know you could fly directly to Chiang Mai. This is how little I knew. So I flew to, to Bangkok and then flew up to Chiang Mai. When did all this happen? How long have you been over there? This most recent stint, I came in summer of last year, 2023, 20, uh, uh, because I got laid off from my tech job. And literally within 24 hours of getting the layoff email, I bought my one-way flight to Thailand. I was like, I don't want to go back to Thailand. The only reason I haven't been there this whole time is I needed to work. But like the second I'm, I'm laid off and the economy is not so great in tech, so is that your plan or what is your plan? Is your plan to stay in Thailand long term or are you, are you there for like, you know, six months to a year and then you're going to go back, make some money and then travel again? Or what's the story? Uh, I'm playing it by ear. I'm in this financial in-between state where I worked for a while in the U.S. I had some businesses. I've saved some money. I'm not quite at my financial independence number. So I'm not in a situation where I need to rush back to the U.S. and make money. Uh, I was very fortunate to get a severance when I got laid off. Um, but I'm also not in a position where I can feel comfortable saying, yeah, I can afford to stay in Thailand permanently. I look at it like right now I'm in my discovery phase. I'm, I'm really trying to discover uh, all of Thailand and all the different Southeast Asian countries and really start to think, okay, where is that long-term place for me? And then go back and continue to build wealth where I'm sure, as you know, in the West, it is much easier for a Western person to build wealth. They know the rules. They know the laws. Uh, they know how to go get a job. They got, you know, friends that can help them like, hey, this this guy could do a good job for you. Uh, so I think it's really important. I think where a lot of guys get into a trap is that they they come over here and they don't think about the long term. They don't think about when they're not going to be able to work for money. Right. They're health, they get older. They don't have the health. They may not be as attractive to potential employers that want the latest skill set. You're doing the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. That's that's your plan, isn't it? Can you just explain to people what that is? I actually found out about the FIRE movement through a guy named Jason Bieber. He does a site called Mr. Free at 33. And he inspired me a lot because he comes from a similarly challenging background. A lot of people think, oh, if you're going to pursue FIRE, you need to come from a wealthy background, this and that. Well, you know, if... According to Jason's story, he didn't have that kind of background. And he went from growing up really poor in Detroit to building a retirement portfolio, basically an investment portfolio that provides him with a monthly income that exceeds his expenses. He actually uh, did this through working in uh, the auto industry. I think he was doing like service for Volkswagen or something like that. And he built up his portfolio by minimizing his expenses. He ended up selling his car. He lived in it. He moved to in a smaller apartment further away from work and he counted every penny. He would have ramen every day for lunch. And a lot of this stuff sounds nuts to a lot of people, to be honest. A lot of people say, I could never make the sacrifice of not owning a personal vehicle. I could never, you know, make these sacrifices. But ultimately, he snowballed his wealth through compounding interest. And I think he also sold a blog. But he got to a point where he had $1,000 a month coming in from this dividend portfolio. And he, owned pub he owns publicly traded U.S. companies, companies that anybody can buy if they've got the money. Uh, to, they can purchase a stock in that company. And in return for their ownership, they get a, a portion of the profits. Um, so he got to the point where he's making $1,000 a month. And in the U.S., you're, you could basically live in your car on that amount of money unless you've got a family member that takes pity on you or something like that. Um, but in Thailand, at the time, especially because he came here about seven years ago, I think it's a little bit harder to do it on a thousand a month uh, in 2024. Uh, but back in 2016, 2017, he came here with a thousand a month. And he basically at that point transitioned from having to sell his time for money to owning his own time. Um, so he's not reliant on a job for a paycheck. He's not reliant on making a manager happy. He's not reliant on getting up every day early and showing up. Uh, you collect dividend checks regardless of the hour that you wake up. And not only is he collecting the dividend checks, but the principal amount is also growing. So while these companies are growing and they're paying out a portion of their profits and dividends, they're also uh, the value of the actual stock is growing alongside uh, the company's growth. Um, and it was just really powerful story to me. I, 
I found out about it in 2019 after I came home because after my first visit to Thailand in 2018, I was like, I want to live there. I don't know how, for how long, but one month is not enough time. And the money equation is really the, one of the most difficult parts about living in Thailand that a lot of people struggle with. Um, they love the idea of living here. They love the weather, the food, the culture, but they think, well, I'm probably not going to qualify for a work, per work permit. Uh, so how could I do it? Well, you do it through investing. Um, so I think it's, it's really a long-term strategy. It's not something most people aren't going to come up with a portfolio overnight. I was looking into it. So it's kind of like, if I was to sum it up real basic, it's kind of like live as frugally as possible in your working years. So you can live, and this is kind of the argument, frugally in your retirement years. But if you do it in Asia, obviously the money goes further. But you see the movement over in the West, it do, like obviously it wouldn't appeal to me because, you know, my my attitude, in, if I was in the West would be, you know, work really hard. So you have a, a good standard of living when you're older. You know, we don't, I, w I wouldn't want to live frugally here and then be an old man in the West and live and have to live really frugally because I retired early. I just prefer to work really hard, build wealth and then retire and enjoy that. But I can see the appeal to it in in asia i can see that appeal like you know you've earned money in the west and you're taking it over to the east i see that appeal so do you have an age then that you're going to retire and I, i'd like to add to that as well to me i think a lot of people um they hear retirement and they think oh i'm just gonna sit on a beach in Pattaya or phuket or Koh Samui, uh and just drink margaritas all day and and to me, it's not the idea of uh, doing nothing. It's the idea, now I can go start a business, right? There's certain types of businesses that you can start with very low capital. You could write a book. You could do all these different things to add to that wealth once you're on your own time. But when you don't own your own time, you're, you're really having to do what you need to do to make that money. Um, but yeah, that's my plan. Now, is it going to happen at a certain age? Um, so I'm 31 now. Now, my conservative estimate is that I will hit this number at 40 years old. I, I choose sales because sales is a career. The inputs are not tied to the outputs. So if you're a really high quality salesperson, uh, especially selling high margin products like software is a great example, uh, then you have the potential to earn quite a bit more than average. But not just that, you can take those sales skills into retirement, right? So like coming out with a product, um, it, whether it be a software product, a book, or something like that. Um, so yeah, I would say 40 is is my conservative estimate. I could hit it sooner than that. I'm not in a rush. To me, the worst thing that a person could do is, is start getting in a rush with their finances because uh, they're going to make blunders. They're going to buy bad investments. They're going to get tied up potentially in debt or some other situation. Uh, this is one of the, I think finances are some of the biggest decisions a person can make in their life. And they need to be really careful about it and really keep the eye on the on the long game. You're in Chiang Mai at the moment, right? I am. I'm in Chiang Mai. What's your, let's talk about your favorite places. You've been to many places in Thailand. What's your, been your favorite place that you could potentially live long term in? You know, I think it has to be Chiang Mai. I've been to Pattaya. Uh, I've spent time in uh, Bangkok like probably half a dozen times. Uh, plan to go to Hat Yai. Haven't spent as much time uh, in the south as the north. I'd also like to see Hua Hin, but Chiang Mai to me, like, and it may not, you know, it's probably not going to work for everybody, but it reminds me a lot of my hometown. Uh, so Nashville, it's not close to any beaches. Uh, it doesn't have the, Chiang Mai still has a tropical feeling, but it doesn't have that tropical seaside feeling. Uh, and so I didn't grow up going to the beach. And so to me, Chiang Mai has everything but the beach. I like the slower pace. I like the friendly people. I like the relaxed atmosphere. Um, you know, I like Bangkok, but I found that Bangkok is a little bit too busy for me. It's, uh, it's a very, very densely populated city. You've got millions and millions, I think 18 million people in the metropolitan area. Uh, and it can be overwhelming. I know some people say, well, you just need to spend more money uh, to have a good time in Bangkok. But I found even if I spend more money, it's still a busy city. There's nothing that's going to take away from that met metropolitan atmosphere. Uh, and then Pattaya, I'm just not, you know, I'm not a drinker. Uh, you know, I, I don't drink at all. It's, it's, it's not something that like I consciously stopped doing. I just found I didn't really enjoy it. Uh, but I wanted to give Pattaya and, and Jom Tien and that area a chance. And 
it just wasn't for me. I'm just not super into the scene. I know it's it's a great place for a lot of people and a lot of people really enjoy it. We spoke about this before we started. Pollution. You know, the smog. And I know Bangkok is not great either. But, it's, you know, it's definitely a factor. What if, if you were to live long term in Chiang Mai, would that impact you? Could you consider moving there because of the pollution? Yeah. So, so built into my fire number, I want a certain amount a month every month. But I also want an emergency fund. And I also want... Uh, a budget for getting out of Chiang Mai every year. So there's the, the, I look at it like cost of life versus cost of living. To exist in Chiang Mai is not very, very expensive, but to actually enjoy your life here, I think that you need to budget to leave Chiang Mai for two months out of every year. I would say two, two and a half months. You want to go down to Koh Samui. You want to go down to Phuket. Uh, I'm going to Hat Yai because I, I find that sometimes the tourist parts of Thailand can be, can remind me a little bit too much of the West. I, I don't like the word authentic. I think it's kind of cliche, but sometimes, you know, you, you're out in Thailand, you see hordes of Western tourists and you're like, okay, what am I doing here? Like I, I came here to have something a little bit different. Like if I want to spend time around a lot of Western people, I have a lot of Western friends back in my home country that I can be around. So let's talk about the expats you've met. So uh, you have a channel, we'll get into that later on, but you, I saw one of your videos, uh, you called it um, the expat status game. I was like, oh, that sounds intriguing. What is the expat pat status game? It's this competitive zero-sum game where people are trying to one-up each other, and it's never-ending. So in the context of expats, um, some of what you'll see and you'll hear a common refrain is, which is better, the Philippines or Thailand? Well, that's apples to oranges. Uh, who's hotter, my girlfriend or his girlfriend? Oh, which bar is better? Which, uh, which car is better? Oh, he drives a Honda. I'm going to drive uh, a Bentley or, you know, whatever it is. Or how long have you been in Thailand? That's probably the, oh, the first God, one. That's, that's a huge one. I'm, I, I've been in Thailand for 20 years, so he's been here for 19. I'm better than him. Or, oh, they just got here six months ago, so I'm better than him. It's such a ridiculous thing. First off, we all have very short and finite lives. And we have to be really conscious about how we spend our time and spending our time competing. Uh, it leads to inauthenticity, right? People start lying. They start boasting about, oh, you've been with this many uh, ladies. I've been with that many ladies. Oh, you partied this hard. Well, I had a wilder night and it never ends. It never ends. There's always going to be a foreigner with more money than you. There's always going to be uh, an even more beautiful Thai woman around the corner. There's always going to be a cooler bar. There's always going to be something better out there. Um, and, and they have a purpose, right? Historically, historically, if you were a high status individual, that could save your life. If you were friends with the king, uh, if you were a merchant and you had a really large business, that could save your life. But in the modern era, in the modern world, they don't have a place. They lead to a lot of conflicts. You see expats getting in fights with each other. I've seen, even see it, saw it here in Chiang Mai at my gym. I'm not going to name the gym. I don't know the names of the individuals involved. Um, but these two guys started cursing each other out over a piece of exercise equipment. And I'm like, oh, come on. Like, this gym isn't that crowded. You can wait. We're not, we're in Chiang Mai. It's not like we're in the West where we're trying to get back to work or we're trying to, uh, you know, get home or trying to beat rush hour or this and that. Like, and these things are everywhere throughout the expat world. I mean, you'll you'll hear people. I've heard people, and it goes both ways too. I've heard people tell me, "Oh, you live in Thailand because you're broke," and then I've heard, I've heard other people tell me, "Oh, you live in Thailand because you're a rich kid." Literally within days of each other. So to some people, they want to play the status of I'm low status. I'm I'm don't have enough. And then to other people, oh, I can't afford to live there, so you're a bad guy because you can. I mean, so these things are endless. They're throughout society. And they lead to a lot of hard feelings and a lot of stress. And I tell people, you know, don't freak out when you encounter something like this, but be aware of it. Be aware that there are expats that they're in this position in Thai society where they don't know where they fit in. Back home, they might have been a successful business owner. They might have had a successful legal career. They might have been a, a top level programmer. And they come here and they don't know where they fit into things, right? They don't. Under, they may not speak the language. They Even if they speak a few words, they may not understand the culture. And so it's almost like they turn to foreigners to like recreate the 
the negative app, some of the negative aspects of back home in the West, I think. The advice would be pick your friends wisely. Yeah, I wouldn't say I get on very well with people that are always comparing themselves to other people. Very egotistical people wouldn't be my sort of cup of tea. Uh, what about, I suppose, to the old age question? You know, are you single? Are you dating around? Or what's the story? I'm single. I, I have done some dating um, on each of my trips here. I've kind of come to the conclusion that the honest thing for me to do as far as making long-term commitments is waiting until I can afford to live here in perpetuity. Um, making sure like, hey, I'm not going to have to ever leave Thailand again unless I want to, as opposed to like, I need to go back home and make money. Because I I think it works for guys that like they bring their partner with them. I think like in your case, it's it's the ideal scenario, right? But for other guys, they're they're having to jet back and forth, which costs a fortune in plane tickets. There, there's always that thought in the back of my mind. What if she meets somebody else in her mind? What if he meets somebody else? Maybe she's never been to the West and doesn't know the messed up dating dynamics in the West. And so there's this, a lot of strain I think that's placed on a relationship. So I think LDR can work short time or for uh, a determinant or finite amount of time. But I think when it's like, hey, and maybe five, six, seven years before I can move there, I just think it's unnecessary strain on the relationship. What about, say, marriage, kids down the line? Could you see yourself having kids? You know, I go back and forth on it. Um, I'm open to it, but... That would definitely would hamper your just... retire, retiring early. It would. It absolutely would. It would definitely be more financial pressure. Um, I go back and forth on it. You know, some days I feel like, man, wouldn't it be lovely uh, to have a family? But based on what I've studied, I think it's it's better to build some wealth before you start a family. I think it it helps a lot. Um, I'm not going to say, you know, nobody you shouldn't have kids unless you're wealthy. That's not fair at all. But I think for me personally, not having family to fall back on um, which can help a lot with with just supporting family, even if you just have a significant other, even if you don't have children in the picture. Um, so in lieu of that, I think you know, it'd be important for me to build wealth. And I'm not one of those people that's like, I don't look at other people with jealousy, but I do wonder, would that make me a happier person? And I think the answer is yes, uh, assuming I have the free time to enjoy it. You know, I think in the West, a lot of us kids, uh, you could call them latchkey kids, where mom and dad both had to work full-time jobs and you kind of, you know, your parents were PlayStation and television and, uh, you know, the basketball hoop. And uh, I don't necessarily want to recreate that either. That's a deep concern in my mind because uh, when my parents were alive, they worked super demanding jobs and difficult careers in the medical field. And those are really time consuming jobs. They're also very stressful. And I think that some people will really struggle to balance, um, struggle to balance career and family, which is, of course, a timeless struggle, but but I think even more so in the modern world. So what about your channel? You you have a YouTube channel. Tell everybody about it. What's it about? What are you doing? It's, it's a channel where basically I made my first video six years ago, and that was in Thailand. I tried Thai Red Bull, and it was just for fun. I was like, this, this is crazy. Like, Red Bull is popular in America. I had no idea it was a Thai invention, right? Uh, and then I just kind of went with it from there. And I make videos about random stuff, just kind of having fun. Uh, but more recently, uh, especially in Colombia, because I, when I went down to Colombia, South America, I was like, I need to start putting out content about my observations because everything about like a lot of this expat content or digital nomad content, traveler content, it, there's a few issues I see. One is it's trying to pitch a vacation, right? They're selling you on their vacation, which is fine. Like no judgment there. Everybody uh, a lot of people work difficult jobs. They got their two weeks off. They want to take a vacation. Uh, and then others were talking about, oh, this is the worst place ever. Or this is the best place ever. And I thought, why don't I actually go for the truth? Like the truth is there's millions of people living in all of these, uh, what you could call traveler hotspots all over the world. Um, they're making do with what they've got. Uh, if you're If you're a traveler with a strong currency, you can come to these other countries and you can have a high standard of living, but you can also get something a little bit different you can have for example affirming experiences right like as uh, an asian american or a small portion of the population um, you go over to asia and you're surrounded by people with a similar background or 
if you're somebody that's uh, Latino and you're growing up in America, but you want to go see, hey, where where is this cu culture, uh, the prevailing culture? You can have those kind of experiences. And so I want to just talk about like what I've learned, um, provide what I call framework or guidelines. I don't believe in, in giving advice. I, I try my best not to give advice because individuals are so different in how they approach things, what they want in their journey, um, what they can afford, right? What their duration of travel is, um, what they have back home. Uh, for me, I don't have as much back home as, as some other people. So the, the big pull back home is career and work. And so I talk about that, like, you know, how do you, yeah, talk, I would say talking about uh, expat finance, digital nomad finance, but also talking about uh, lifestyle preferences, things like weather. I think a lot of people don't really talk about weather near as much um, as, you know, as is valuable for a lot of people. Cool, man. Well, I'll leave the link down below in the description um, and go over, check out Alex Living Abroad. That's the name, isn't it? That is the name. Uh, I'm, I'm strongly thinking about changing it up because there's a great channel, a much, much bigger channel called Living Abroad. Uh, and so sometimes I think... Uh, uh, you he's know, based in the Phil that's Alex, him. isn't he? He's based in the same name yeah. as you, is that Alex, and he's based in the Philippines. I've interviewed him. Really, I didn't. Yeah, way back. Like I two I'll years have to ago. go back and watch that. Yeah, I'll have to go Bangkok. back and watch that. That's so cool. Um, um have you? Yeah. So, do you follow the um the uh, the Philipp the bloggers in the Philippines? I do. I do. I was actually interviewed by by one several years back. Did you hear what happened on that island, Dumaguete? Yeah, I was actually interviewed by uh, by Mark several okay. years ago. All right. I mean, I don't know. I've this is all new to me. I've not. I didn't really follow the the Philippine the vloggers in the Philippines before all this happened. I did interview um, Simon, who's based over there, a couple of weeks ago, and that was kind of like my first. I've always kind of followed them. I've always looked at what they're doing. I knew I knew there's a lot of people that are interested in that kind of content as well. Um, but I mean, I don't know what's going on at this island, man. These guys are fighting with each other. I mean, look, enjoy your retirement. Do you know what I mean? What do they call it? Dramageddy. Yeah, yeah. That's the name for it, Dramageddy. And I, I think it's really unfortunate. It's like you spend all this time, effort, money uh, to go halfway around the world. And I'm not here to accuse this guy or that guy. Uh, I think that everybody should learn something from that scenario and and think, how can I avoid that situation? Because that situation, uh, it could have been resolved much more easily with a, hey, you know, let's shake hands. Let's forget about it. Let's go on about our business. This, this isn't worth getting in trouble over. This isn't worth um, – just the consequences, right? Because it's a can of worms. That's why I avoid trouble as much as I can is it's a can of worms. Yeah. So I think, right, these islands, small islands where, you know, there's a limited numbers of people, you form these cliques. Now I've seen good, the good and bad. I'd say the good is the island of Koh Chang. If you've ever, if you've been there, there's some, a great group of expats on the island. They all know each other. They all do activities together, play sports, I think they have like a, a, a biker club that they ride around the island. They do all this cool stuff. So they're kind of a tight knit, friendly expat bunch. But I've also been in places where I've, I've seen the opposite. I've seen cliques where you're, you, you're the only white guy walking in somewhere and people are like, who's this guy? You know, maybe that's what's going on on that island where there's cliques. They don't like each other. All it takes is a couple of toxic people can change the dynamic of a group, all this type of stuff. It's boiling, it's sizzling over. It's a small island. They see each other all the time. Boom. Perfect recipe for drama or whatever. Um, you do see it with small expat groups sometimes, but you also have like Bangkok's a different story because it's, you know, there's thousands and thousands of expats there. So you, you can always, you know, you lots of options for different types of people. But Alex, I think we'll leave it there, man. Uh, th thanks so much for having me, Pete. I've really enjoyed our chat today. Um, really, uh, looking forward to seeing more of your interviews. I think that you have a, a certain way of, of getting to the story and, and I'm looking forward to more. Cheers, man. What we'll do is we'll get you on again down the line. You know, I'll be following your channel um, and uh, I'll be watching your content. We'll get you on again. Maybe when you have some kind of big update, you know, we'll get you on. Or if you have any interesting opinions on expat life or life in Thailand or whatever, send me an email and we'll see if we can work something out.
Take it easy. Enjoy your enjoy your Saturday. You have a good one, Pete.